G'day and welcome to the Six Pack Deep MMA show with Ted. So it's a bit of a spin-off from our regular Six Pack Deep podcast where I'm going to be going through a um, few fights that are going to be coming up um, on the next fight night or pay-per-view as well as just a couple of um, things that are going on in the world of MMA at the moment. So if you like this, chuck us a like, subscribe, leave a comment if there's anything that you want me to talk about, whether it's um, upcoming fights, news about particular fighters or their careers, or even other promotions other than UFCs. I will also be talking about Bellator and PFL and 1FC occasionally, but this will primarily be in regards to the UFC. So before we get started, I do apologize if I do end up random, rambling a bit. It's just me for this one. This isn't really within Jacobs Wilhouse talking about MMA, um, but he will occasionally join me um, when I'm going to be breaking down some fights right before they begin. But let's go. All right. Thanks for listening in, guys. So to start this off, we're just going to be going through um, the upcoming fight night, um, which is on June 6th here in Australia, um, so obviously over in America, June 5th, Saturday, um, and that is going to be headlined by Rosenstruck versus Saki at heavyweight, so that should be quite a good fight, and we'll get to that one, um, but before we go, I'm going to start off with a couple of fights just on the prelim card, um, just talk about a couple of fighters that I've enjoyed watching, um, and how I think the fight's going to go, I'm not going to break down every single fight, because I don't know all of the fighters, or even if I do know some of them, I'm just, I'm not overly invested in them, um, and yeah, um, but we'll start off with Trinaldo versus Selikov, so Trinaldo is an interesting fighter, he's one that I've watched fight a number of times, I've always found him Not necessarily a boring fighter by any means, but not not an interesting fighter. He's just never really captured my attention. Um, so much as you know, I see him fight, I'm like, this is a fight that I really want to see. I think it's got fight of the night or um, performance of the night potential. Um, he's a solid fighter. He's actually got a much better record than I thought he would. He's at 26 wins and 7 um, losses. And I mean, having a look here, since 2016, he's lost to Kevin Lee, James Vick, and Alexander Hernandez. No shame in any of those losses, but at the same time, he's picked up wins against Pearson, Medeiros, Felder, um, Jim Miller, who Jim Miller's kind of started going on a bit of a run um, recently. Um, even Bobby Green um, and John Modeski. So he's put in a few things together. I've been pretty impressed. But overall, it's not something I really look to watch. And I just don't think that he... He's always looking... For the finish, I think he's quite content to use his pressure. Um, he's happy to lay on top of you um, and just try and get the decision. Um, and you know, that's not necessarily the wrong thing. It works well for a lot of people, um, but it doesn't put asses on seats. Now, he's going up against Muslim Salikov. So... He's quite an interesting fighter, and yeah, he's definitely not someone that's just looking to eke out a decision. Now, of his 17 wins, 12 have been by um, KO or TKO, and two have, been fin- uh, two have been submissions, so he's only got three decisions um, in his career, although obviously not quite as extensive a career as Trinaldo, but still, 19 fights, 17 wins, and... 14 finishes in those 17 wins. So really impressive stuff there. Having a look at his um, last couple of fights, I honestly, I think that this one will go to the third round. Now I can see him getting a third round TKO um, on the ground. 
If he can't get that though, I am going to be going through with a decision. It will be, I'll give Trinaldo the second round. So I think if it goes to the decision, it will be Selikov winning 29-28. But it will be a pretty resounding 29-20. I don't think there'll be too many people, if any, kind of disputing that. Um, so moving on from that, we've got Tenoboza versus Ila Latifi. Now, Latifi, very, very, what's the word? He's an interesting fighter to watch. You look at him and automatically you're just like, this guy could be a world beater. Bloke's chiseled from stone. At least he was a light heavyweight. He obviously looks like he's put on the um, pounds a bit more around the gut at heavyweight, but still extremely strong. Um, but he's just never been able to put it all together. Um, so, I mean, he's got what? 14 wins and 8 losses, um, and they're pretty, his wins are pretty sp evenly split. He's got 6 wins, 4 submissions, and 4 decisions, so he can kind of do it all when he's on, but he's on a 3 fight loss streak. Now, people that he's lost to, there's no shame in losing. He lost to Corey Anderson, Vulcan Odomizer, and Derek Lewis. Now, obviously... Anyone can lose to Lewis. Even the upcoming fight, if it does go ahead, um, Nganu versus Lewis. I think Nganu would win, but I would not be surprised if Lewis won either. Um, he's just got that crazy one-punch knockout power, and he's durable. Um, and obviously Anderson was going on a bit of a run. Um, Odomizer at one stage, he was looking like he was potentially going to be the future of the... Um, Light heavyweight division, not necessarily um, champion, or if he was champion, wouldn't expect to be a long-term champion, but he'd be right up there, and Odomize is just not there anymore. So his last win was against Ovin St. Pru, where, yeah, Latifi, I, I, don't, I don't think he's going to win. I think he's, in his best days, are certainly past him. He's 37 now. Um, but he's not going to be getting any younger, and I just think that he's up against someone that, you know, eight years younger than him, in Tanner Boza, who every new generation of fighter that's coming through, they're able to do more the more, the more well put together. If you look at it, I started watching UFC, the um, first fight I saw um, was Anderson Silva versus... Chris Lieben, sorry, I forgot his name there. So obviously, back then, you know, you could do a couple of things, but it really was more, you had your specialists, you had your boxers, you had your kickbox Muay Thais, um, wrestlers, judo specialists, and of course, um, your presumed jiu-jitsu artists. Um, now, forget about the UFC, to make it, to even kind of have reasonable success, even on a regional circuit, you've got to be able to put at least striking and either wrestling or jiu-jitsu together somewhat seamlessly. Obviously, I'm not expecting to be an absolute world beater on the regional circuit, but got to be there. And Boza, he can do that. His record may not show. He's only got the two submissions. He's got 10 knockouts and seven decisions, but he will fight through them. Um, He'll fight through the fight. He'll go through the pain. He's not going to give up. Um, and I think overall, he's just got a bit more of a skill set. He's younger. He's hungrier. I'm going to be giving Bozo the win. And I'm going to say second round knockout for Bozo. So that's my prediction. So, so far, we've got Salikov. It's a flip of a coin, whether it's going to be a third round TKO um, or a decision, but Boza, I think that's going to be a second round knockout. Now on to the um, main fight of the prelims, Amrakani versus Kamalia Kirk. Now, I'll be honest, I did not know who Kirk was. I've had to watch his 
um, fight. Um, most recently watching, um, didn't see his most recent fight, I watched um, his fight against Santos. And he looked good, man. He, he's got good pressure. He looks dangerous on the feet. But Amikani's got a lot more experience, and he's he's fought a lot of strikers, and this is a guy that is not a striker. You don't go out thinking, oh yeah, Amikani's going to knock him out, even if it's on the ground, where he can be very top-heavy. Um, but I think he's got a lot more experience. Um, with that being said, I'm always a fan of some young guys getting the short call up to come and fight. I mean, he fought most recently here. Um, May 14th, so literally two weeks ago. I'm recording this on the 28th of May. So he's going to be hungry. He's just got back in the... He's just getting out of the cage. Um, I'm going to give the win to Kirk. And I haven't seen enough of his fights to know how he's going to win. Um, If I'm having a look at his record, five knockouts, six submissions, no decisions. So he's going to get a finish, I would say. Um, And I would say most likely he's probably going to try and keep things on the feet, just because obviously Amakani is really um, well-trained on the ground. So... This is just a talk and shit kind of prediction, but I'm going to say first round will be a late first round knockout. So that's my prediction. So that is the undercard there. We're having a look at the main card now, and I'm going to start off with Pozzanibio versus Baeza. So let's start with Pozzanibio. He's a fun fighter to watch. Um, I've once again, he's not someone I look at as a world beater, but he's someone that I enjoy watching. So I am going to give him the advantage in this purely because I haven't seen these uh, fight. I know that he's undefeated. I um, mean, obviously, fairly younger. But I just I don't know enough about him. <sighs> no, I'm going Pozzanibio. He's going to win, and I think it's going to be a decision win, maybe a split decision. Moving on, Walt Harris versus Martian Tybura. So, I've watching Harris fight. It's it's tough, just because everything just kind of happened to him. Um, his daughter being murdered. Um, he takes a lot of time off, understandably so. Um, he comes back and he fights. What was it? Um, Overeem looks really good, but just. Get caught and Overeem just uses his experience. Um, but I always like watching him fight. That being said, I just think that Martian Tybura offers a little bit more. He's a bit more well versed. He can kind of do everything he can do, um, his submissions, he can do um, knockouts, and he can eat out that um, decision as well. Not that I think it's going to go to decision. It's very rare that I would expect a heavyweight fight to go to decision. Um, I think I'll make it past the first round. I'm going to go second round knockout for Taibora. That is going to be my prediction. And then on to the main event here. We've obviously got... Rosenstruck versus Saki. And Rosenstruck has looked fucking great. I mean, he's lost his two fights to what? Um, he lost to Nganu. 
And before that, he looked fucking great, other than that Overeem fight where he was losing for most of the fight, up to, what, the last 10 seconds, maybe the last 5 seconds, where he just blasted Overeem, made his face explode. Um, and then he did have that absolute boring-ass fight against Cyril Gain, but Gain's just got an awkward kind of style of fighting, um, well, I can understand why he was going to be hesitant. You don't really want to fight a counter-striker and be pushing forward non-stop. So, I can understand it. Saki, bloke's out to kill. He wants to take your head off. But I just don't see him doing that. I don't think he's got the same amount of power that Rosenstreet's got. And Rosenstreet can take a punch. The only person that's been able to knock him out was in Ghana, you can do that to anyone in the world. Um, this is this is one that I am predicting a first round knockout for Rosenstruck. Um, so that's my predictions. This is for the upcoming fight night card, which is next Sunday for us here in Australia, um, or Saturday for people listening in America or other parts of the world. Now, moving on to some news, obviously one of the biggest stories going on over the past couple of weeks, maybe even month, um, the Diego Sanchez um, and Joshua Faber situation, obviously UFC releasing um, Sanchez after some worrying comments made by Fabia where they're not sure what's going on with Sanchez, does he have CTA, uh, most probably he does, but yeah, when you start turning around going, we need all of your medical, we need all of these medical records, we need to do this and the other, they turned went, you know what, we're good, we're going to pay you for the rest of your contract. They never pay anyone. That's how much respect they had for Sanchez. They pay around and just went, look, let's just, let's cut ties here. We love you. We don't want to make you, we don't want to have you fight anymore. And I 100% respect that. I'm I wish they did that for more fighters. I'm hoping they'll do that for more fighters going forward. Um, if Cerrone loses his next fight, I'm hoping they're doing the same thing with him. Um, but then, after that split, there was a video that came out of them training, which was just him, hanging, Sanchez hanging upside down and Xavier punching, like slapping him in the head, kicking him. It was a really disgusting thing to see um to be honest especially after they've been talking about what we're worried about is um health especially with the long-term damages and potential cte um to then be going and uploading that and then it comes out oh no we do this for about 20 hours a day um it was honestly the most one of the most disgusting things i have seen just because of where it seems like sanchez's Head he's at at the moment, um, and most likely for the rest of his life. Um, and that led to an outpouring of people all throughout the MMA community just begging him to cut ties with Fabio, who is an absolute fucking leech. He's got no business being in the MMA world, let alone being a coach, being a sole coach, trainer. And cornerman for someone as respected and well versed and experienced as Diego Sanchez, and not just let me touch it there, but also vulnerable. Diego Sanchez is obviously quite vulnerable. He's had went for a lot of things in his life. Um, and I mean, didn't seem like he was going to get through when I was seeing all these comments like, please get rid of him for the love of God, get rid of him. Um, he Sanchez even came out talking about how he's had to cut off his family um, because they didn't like Fabia. But someone, I don't know who, we're probably never going to know who, but someone finally managed to get through to him or maybe it was just a sheer bulk of people where it was fight, Sanchez was just like, look at everything that's going on in my life. He's the one factor that everyone's saying he's the problem. He's the problem. Cut ties with Fabia. Thank God. Hallelujah. Um... I was kind of thinking, that's that. We'll probably see a couple of things. Um, might hear one or two other things from Fabia, but it won't be anything um, too important. Um, and he'll just 
disappear and he'll just be you know, the butt of the joke, similar to um, Rousey's coach. I can't remember his name anymore, but you get these coaches that just shouldn't be coaches, and that's what I thought it was going to be. He come, Fabia comes out and does an interview, and he's just saying all this fucking shit about Sanchez, but it's not just saying, you know, this is a ter- like Sanchez is an idiot or he's a terrible guy or he did this and he's trying to going, yeah, Sanchez used me. Sanchez, everyone thinks he's a great guy. He's not. He's like talking about how after he got a divorce, um, Sanchez went and got a one bedroom apartment despite being a dad. So obviously trying to cast illusions on just a quality of person that Sanchez is or quality of father that he is which is out of line. You should never be talking about that sort of stuff. Um, But then one thing that I found pretty fucking hilarious, he talks about how Sanchez was using Fabia. But then that same interview talks about how apparently Sanchez was in special education, Um, which if it's true, don't fucking talk about it. You've got no right to talk about it. But at the same time, why the fuck would you mention that right after saying, this guy used me. So you're saying that you got used by someone that was in special ed. What's that saying about you? This guy is an absolute piece of shit. I hope to God this is the last that we're ever going to be seen about him. Um, I think we'll see him pop up for a couple of our interviews, but for the most part, he's done. Um... He's ruined his image, and yeah, I don't think anyone in their right mind is really going to have anything to do with him, unless you're Tony Ferguson. Fabia, stay the fuck away from Ferguson. Uh, But that's um, sort of a very brief recap. Obviously, there's a lot more details to go into. That would be a whole episode in and of itself, um, if I was going to break down the whole Fabia Sanchez relationship and where it all came and everything that um, occurred. But he's gone. Let's leave it at that. On to some other news. John Jones has got himself a new manager. And he's he's coming out. He's talking about how he wants to go and sit down with the UFC. Um, so he's got Richard Schaefer. So he's been a manager within combat sports for um, quite a while. He's worked with Mayweather, De La Hoya, Canelo, Hopkins... Um, so obviously more boxing, but that's fine. You still know the fight game. And more importantly, you know negotiations. I would imagine negotiations are even harder in boxing because everyone wants to kind of be that number one A side, not the B side. Um, whereas it's not quite as much of a factor, I don't think, within the um, UFC or MMA world. Um, but he came out and he was like, look, I want to sit down with the UFC. We're going to negotiate and I want to find a deal. That neither that neither side are happy with, but both sides can live with. I think that's the right approach, especially for the relationship that John Jones and the UFC have. Obviously, John Jones, arguably the greatest fighter of all time, youngest champion, um, being one of the most exciting fighters. He's seen a bit of a decline, and he's moving up. He's taking a significant risk. He's moving up to heavyweight at a time where. He's never looked like he's been more in danger than he has um, in his past couple of fights. I mean, that Dominic Reyes fight, I had him winning, but I, would, I wouldn't I would have been mad. I wouldn't have been surprised if Reyes won. And Santos. Santos almost beat him with both his legs fucking busted. Um, so... I, there were talks about $30 million. Jones is refuting that, saying, no, I never asked for $30 million. Um, Good. I, at this stage, I don't think you're wanting $30 million. Look, win a, win a fight or two up at heavyweight, do it in dominant fashion, then maybe come back to that. But same time, look, 15 mil. I reckon that's reasonable. You get 15, 15 to 20 mil for Jones first and Garnu. I mean, that's a fight that's going to sell fucking pay-per-views. I, maybe not top five all time, but it'd be very close to the top five of all time. 
in terms of pay-per-view buyers um, and just the online traction people are going to be talking about. I mean, everyone knows about and Garnu now is its absolute phenom. So I'm hoping by having this new management and someone that's going in there and just going, look, John, I want to get you to fight. I want to make you money. I want you to know you're not going to get as much money as you want and I'm not going to let them give you as much money as what they want. We're going to meet midway. So the midway mark, you're just going to have to like it and move on. And I think that's a really promising um, future for John Jones and the UFC. So I do apologize for the rambling. Obviously, my first go talking by myself, I'm also trying to have a look at stuff on the computer. So it was very clunky. I promise I will try and do better in the future. But if you have any recommendations, please chuck a comment. Let me know. Welcome all feedback. But if you did like it, give us a like, give us a subscribe. And thank you for listening to the Six Pack Deep MMA Show with Ted.